this gift to the body of Christ, a very powerful woman of God. She's a truly uh, a teacher. That's one of the uh, dimensions that Christ had divided into her. And uh, she uh, uh, teach, preach, pray, and prophesy and has been doing a wonderful job teaching us concerning about the spring feast. She have really had brought forth some, make, some make, um, in other words, the things that has been hidden to us, the Lord have used her to bring it into the light, amen, so that we can go forth into our promise, amen. So I present this some and introduce the others none other than Dr. Sandra R. Gay. Let's thank God for her. Let's give it up for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There's none like our God. Hallelujah. It's truly a blessing to be here and to be able to share this month. Uh, this is the last of my series. Um, we're going to um, have a couple little uh, extras today. And so we're, we're looking to have a good time. Amen. As we continue to journey through the word of God. Amen. So let us uh, begin to, uh, while we're standing, let's uh, read the scriptures. I have them on slides so we can, uh, the first uh, three slides, we have our scripture basis for our teaching today. And we'll read that all together. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, Concerning the feast of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. And then verses 15 and 16, all together. And you shall count unto you from the morrow, after the Sabbath, from the day that ye brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete, even unto, next slide, even until the morrow, after the seventh Sabbath, shall ye number 50 days, and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. And Father, we thank you once again for your word. Lord, we thank you that it is alive, and even, Lord, as we partake once again of the uh, information regarding the revelation regarding your spring feast, we thank you, Lord, that it's becoming even more alive in our life, and as we read your word, Lord, that it's becoming even more stirred up in us. So, Lord, as we lift this time up to you, Lord, we thank you for all that you desire to accomplish. Lord, I don't know what you're going to do, but you do, Lord. So I decrease that you may increase, Lord, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart will be acceptable in your sight, Lord. For you alone are my strength and my redeemer, and I give you glory, honor, and praise for it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and tell them and ask them. Are you relying on the word of God? As we spring forth the next slide, we're in the 2017 Spring Feast of the Lord. And this is part five that we are listening or that we are, are uh, embarking upon today. If I could have that slide, please. And we are, the subtopic is relying on God's word relying on God's word and that's what we have been learning of course as I've been doing this five-part series we started out in resting in the Lord we and responding the Lord relating uh, to the word and also uh, uh, re re releasing the word and now we're relying on the word so uh, all in in theme with the uh, the um, prophetic words that we have heard this year about the sword which is also the word of God and so it's so important that we embrace the word of God I was talking with someone the other day and I was just talking to them about you know because there's so many different religions that are rising up and there's so much confusion that's coming uh, uh, happening to the body of Christ and 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 there's and, and the generations uh, before us are, are are looking for that truth they're searching for that truth and you know the the enemy will bring that counterfeit truth he'll make that he'll make it sound like truth because the word of God says that in the last days that we're going to be having itchy ears we're going to want to hear what we want to hear and not necessarily want to hear truth but the truth is still able to set you free because when you get truth then you'll be able to rest in God's word and so you know a revelation of God's word is what we need in this time and season our eyes need to be open this is a decade of the eye we need to continue to pray that God will open up the eyes of people open up the eyes of even the saints of God because the Bible said if it wasn't for the elect you know that there, there would be even the, if it wasn't for the uh, 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 
as far as the, the knowledge of the word, that even the elect would be fooled. And this is a time that there are many elect that are leaving the faith because they have not embraced and understand and had a revelation of God's word. And we in Acts Ministries, we have been praying uh, over a year for a revelation of who Christ Jesus is and who we are in Christ Jesus. And we know that Christ is the word made flesh. So when we get a revelation of Christ Jesus, we're getting a revelation of his word. And so we're learning his word. And one of the things that we've learned that God has showed us this uh, season that we've been in is that the word will expose that which is false. The word will expose that which, which is not true because what it will do, it will, it will give you in a comparison. See, the enemy brings confusion so you can't tell whether right is wrong or, right, or wrong is right. And unless you have the word and hold on to the word and don't allow anything to come against the word of God and your revelation of the word of God, no matter who it is, no matter what they're saying or what they're thinking, because the bottom line is that if we, we really have a revelation of the word, then we also understand that heaven and earth is going to pass away, but his word is going to remain, that the, the world that we live in was framed by the word of God, amen. So we have to, we need to hold on to the word of God. So this is the, the final of the uh, spring feasts, and there are four feasts uh, that we that are celebrated in the spring. These are God's feasts. They're not Jewish feasts. They're not biblical feasts. They are God's feasts. They are his appointed times that he has uh, elected and his appointed and also his holidays. Though if there's any holidays that we want to uh, 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 press into is his holidays because the world's holidays are designed to rob us to cause us to feel depressed and discouraged because we can't meet the standards that we see the world is telling us that we need to meet. But we as Christians, we are, we are uh, receiving the truth of God's word and it's liberating us, it's giving us that freedom that you know what, if the world says we need to celebrate this holiday and, and you don't have the finances to celebrate the way that, they, that the world is trying to push you to, to, do, to get in debt to, se to celebrate it, then you have that freedom and that, that peace of mind. Hey, I can release that because God hasn't told me to do that anyway. See, and that's the key. And, and, and the enemy wants to keep us in bondage because if we're in bondage, we're not going to give the way we need to for the gospel to go forth. We're going to have an attitude when it comes times to give. And I know people that have left churches because it was time to give and they didn't want to give. So, you know, it, these things are really important. And, and we look at the fact that God uses our resources as a means in order to sow seeds for harvest. So that's because that it, it separates us from those resources where we no longer see it as ours, but we see it as God giving us the stewardship over them and to manage them for him. So this particular feast is a, uh, awesome. All of them are awesome. This is powerful because it talks about God's provision, talks about his, uh, his, his protection, and talks about his promises. And, of course, all the feasts do, and this reinforces it because there's so many things that take place uh, when we talk about the feast uh, that's coming up, and that is the Feast of Pentecost. And if we can bring that uh, slide up, please. And we know the Feast of Pentecost, we relate it also to, to the, um, the, the coming forth of, or the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, amen? So this is the fourth feast, spring feast is the Feast of Pentecost. And uh, we're going to be uh, talking about that today, and then I'm going to do a, a summary, and then we have uh, a Deacon Neil is going to just share from his generation's perspective as far as learning about the feast. And then we also have the young people, uh, the youth uh, department is also going to share a few minutes too. So we you know, have a nice summary that's going to take place as we finish up this time, amen. So when we, when we look at the... Um, the uh, fourth feast, th we're talking about the feast of, feast of Pentecost. And that's next slide, when it talks about the uh, day of Pentecost, uh, it's the 50th day of the feast of Pentecost. The other names for the uh, Feast of Pentecost, and you might want to uh, jot these down because we will have a, a nice surprise for you on Wednesday. And so as much as you have in your notes, it's going to be real helpful. <laughs> hint, hint. 
All right. So it's also called the Feast of Weeks. It's also called the Feast of Harvest. And also it's called the Feast of First Fruits. Well, you say, well, that's kind of confusing because last week we talked about the Feast of First Fruits, did we not? But when we, we will learn in Pentecost, it's called the first of the Feast of First Fruits also. And, and we also have another of uh, two feasts that are called the same thing. That's the Feast of Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. A lot of times both of them are called the, the, the Feast of Passover. Might want to jot that down for Wednesday. Anyway, it says, uh, Exodus 23, 16 says, celebrate the feast of harvest with the first fruits of the crop you sow in the field. And we know that uh, the uh, first uh, fruits last week we talked about was barley. This is the season for the wheat crop as far as this, the weeks of Pentecost. All right. Next slide, please. All right. So we just read that scripture. Let us read it again, uh, Leviticus 23, 15, and 16. And ye shall count unto you from the morrow, after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even unto the morrow are the seven Sabbaths shall ye number 50 days. So uh, what it's saying here is, uh, do you remember the, the day that you brought, they brought the sheaf of the barley in was called the Feast of First Fruits, okay, the first one. And so what, he was, what they're saying is that the first fruits offering from the barley is the start of the Pentecost, uh, of the seven weeks of Pentecost, which is the wheat harvest that's taken place. So what we, what we see is the sevens is that there's seven, which is the Sabbath, there's seven weeks, so you got seven sevens. Think about that because seven is the it, it stands for what? Completion stands for maturity. We're in the year. They also talk for about fulfillment. So there's a fulfillment to take place. So we have seven. We have seven sevens, and then we have one day, which is the uh, the day before that it starts, which is uh, uh, first fruits, and it equals the 50. So we see that uh, when you look at it visually, that's what that scripture is saying in Leviticus 23, 15, and 16. All right, if we can go to the next slide, please. All right, also, you might want to write this down, the Feast of Pentecost is also called the Feast of Shavuot. And that word Shavuot in the Hebrew is a Hebrew word which means weeks because it's also called the Feast of Weeks. So what happens, the Feast of Pentecost starts out with first fruits, and they bring the uncut crop in, and they take it before the priest, and the priest weighs it for the Lord, right? So what they do for Pentecost, at the end of Pentecost, they actually bake two loaves of bread, and they use the leaven. They, the God told them to bake the bread and use leaven. And they're going to take that to the priest at the end of the Pentecost, the Feast of Pentecost. And the, fee the, the, the priest will also break, break that, will also bring that one before. So that next uh, slide should be a scripture. Here's the instructions. Re let's read that. You shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two tenths deals. They shall be of fine flour. They shall be baking with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. So Pentecost starts with the barley first fruits, which is the uncut version of the crop. And then it ends with them actually taking the grain from the first fruits and using it along with the leaven to bake bread because you know that the unleavened bread which uh, they celebrated previously to first fruits was uh, for seven days and they could not eat any leaven in that bread but this is the time they're able to bake the bread with the grain from the first fruits and they're able to, and they take it to the um to the priest and the priest weighs it before the lord so uh, that next slide please it shows that the the bread being lifted up before the Lord, they take the two leaves, uh, two two loaves, and they they uh, wave it before the Lord. Uh, symbolically speaking, th you know, some uh, scholars or theologians believe the two loaves represent the Jew and the Gentile coming together, being one uh, new man, because that's what they call the Messianic Jew. They call them uh, one new man. And so, uh, in any event, there there are so many. Uh, uh, 
symbolic things we look at when we look at the fact that it talks about uh, Pentecost, the beginning of Pentecost, as far as in the natural, in the Old Testament, and then the end of Pentecost, and how they actually take and put leaven in the bread, and it shows that the, the, uh, the, the imperfection of man. So we're seeing the the uh, symbol, uh, symbolizing birth, the, new, the, the first fruits, grains being used to bake the bread, and then new loaves being created. And so likewise, we also will see that as we progress in our teaching today, okay? So I wanna share with you some facts about uh, the Feast of Pentecost. That next slide, uh, I have four points I wanna share uh, at one at a time. First of all, I wanna clarify one thing, that Pentecost did not happen the day the Holy Spirit was poured out. Pentecost did not happen the day the Holy Spirit was poured out. That's what I was taught for years, and there's a few others that I know that were taught, was taught that. But what happened was that the Holy Spirit was poured out on the last day of the Feast of Pentecost. So that was the first fruits offering for the birth of the church. See, in the natural, the first fruit offering grain was used to make the bread, the natural bread. But when we look at the Feast of Pentecost, as far as the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, there was the birth of the church. Amen. So we'll find that in Acts, the second chapter, verse 1. And I'll read that uh, for time's sake. It says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. See, that's when the Holy Spirit, so when the day of Pentecost, that means when the Feast of Pentecost fully came, that last day of Pentecost, and I want to read it in God's Word. I like it in God's Word, Acts 2, 1 in God's Word interpretation. It says, when Pentecost, the 50th day after Passover came, all the believers were together in one place. Now, doesn't that make it a little clearer? The fact is that to let you know that it was during the Feast of Pentecost. And so sometimes, you know, we, we, th that's kind of overshadowed by the, the, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit that we, we focus on that, which is, you know, is, is important. But the timing of it is important. And that's what we, you know, when we study these feasts is to, to embrace the fact that God is a God of time. And there's sp specific times that he does things. And if we get in sync with that and we get in a rhythm with the Holy Spirit and we get in alignment with God, that we'll see things happening faster than, they, than we've seen before. I mean, how many have experienced that? I mean, there's times when I'll just think of something before I even get a chance to even really begin to ponder and pray over God's already answered it when you're in the right rhythm when you're in the right timing of God and God tells us that because that's how we're going to get the connection if you want to make the connection you got to know the right time does that make sense okay so Pentecost did not happen the day the Holy Spirit was poured out the second thing on, uh, for the Feast of Pentecost is that, that Pentecost is the Greek name for the number 50 the third thing is, when we look at the number 50, the number 50 is the number of jubilee. So these, these numbers that God uses, the timing, what have you, all that work together for our benefit if we can tap into it and get an understanding of it. So it is the number of jubilees. So it, when we talk about jubilee, according to the scripture, is a time when debts are canceled. What time of jubilee is a time when, when people are set free it also is a time where there's a new harvest that's brought into our lives so jubilee is a time when god restores all the blessings so if there's anything that we may feel that we have lost anything that we, we felt we've been rejected by or we've missed that this that jubilee is a time of rest uh, restoring recovering rescuing and redeeming this is the time of pentecost and god is saying it's a time of god uh, beginning to uh, gather those things that we thought we had lost so when the so when the children of israel when they left egypt they did not leave egypt empty handed i mean not only did they have their things and they didn't have a whole lot of time to pack Okay, because he told them, all right, you, you stand there with your foot, feet girded, with your shoes on. You're going to eat the Passover. And when I say it's time to go, then you need to go. Yeah, yeah. See? 
And so they didn't have a whole lot of time to, you know, to, to, to pack up a U-Haul and, and get all their things, you know, situated so they can, they can uh, make a move. Amen. But God took care of them. And before they left, here they were in slavery for 400 years. They were serving the Egyptians, and, and uh, they were under hard taskmasters. They, the Egyptians tried to put a lot of work on them to try to break them down, and all they did was make them stronger. And so we got to think about that. You know, when we think that we're at a place that we're going to break down, that's a time where when you call on the God, on the Lord, that he's going to build you up. He's going to strengthen you. When, it, when it's time, when we think it's time to throw out in the towel and give up, that's a time you grab that towel and to run with it because you know something is coming around the corner. Something is about to come. When you feel that pressure and you feel that discouragement, you feel uh, all hope is gone, that's the time where you to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord and watch him open up that Red Sea and allow you to walk it through like he did them. They were able to plunder the Egyptians. It's like they weren't going back, so God told them to borrow from the Egyptians. <laughs> borrow from them. Gold and silver. And, they, and the Egyptians gave it to them too. Well, I guess I would, too. If I'd been going through nine plagues and had another one on my breathing down my neck, I think I'd give away my, my jewelry, too. So God is a God of abundance, and he wants us to walk in abundance. Uh, and he is a God that provides miraculous provision for us. So they, he, he watched over them. He took care of them. He got, guided them by the day. With the, with the cloud, to, and that cloud overshadowed them and protected them for the, uh, from the sun. He, uh, he, he caused the fire to go before them at night. So they had heat. They had, they had the visual. They had the light to see, but they also had heat to keep them warm because as hot as the desert is, at night it's extremely cold. So God made every supernatural provision that they could ask for, and that's because it's a time and season of jubilee. Okay, and then and the next thing is that um, that uh, Pentecost is one of the three pilgrim feasts. And the pilgrim feasts are those three times that God spoke to the children of Israel that they are to re, that the men are to report to the to the temple and that they are not to report empty-handed. So we actually have three, which is um, unleavened bread is one is the um, is uh, one which we do which they do, and then they have the Pentecost, and then they have the feast of Tabernacles. So Exodus 34 verses 22 through 24 says, and thou shalt observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of wheat harvest, the feast of ingathering of the year. Thrice in the year shall all your men, children, appear before the Lord God, the God of Israel. For I will cast out the nations before you and enlarge your borders. Neither shall any man desire your land when thou shalt go up to appear before the Lord your God thrice in the year. So the three promises that we see in this particular scripture is, number one, God says, if you appear before me in the time that I say, and you come before me with your offering, he says, I'm going to cast out the nations before you. I'm going to protect you. He says, number two, I'm going to enlarge your borders. I'm going to make provision for you. And then number three in that same scripture, he says, then no one is going to desire your land. He makes a promise to the people. Amen. So when we, when we look at the Feast of Pentecost, there's so many promises in that as we're walking down that journey for those seven weeks. Ne next slide, please. All right. In the I'm contrasting, I want to contrast the Old Testament and the New Testament when we look at the Feast of, of uh, Pentecost, if you will, because I've done that with the other feasts, and it's so important to see the connection, to see the tie-in. First of all, in the Old Testament, it was a 50-day journey from Egypt to Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is when they received the Ten Commandments, amen. So when we look at the Old Testament, we know the Old Testament is the shadow, but the New Testament is the fulfillment. Can you say that? Old Testament is the shadow but the New Testament is a fulfillment and we look at that amen so it was a time it was a birth of a nation when we look at the 50-day journey that they took to to uh, receive the uh, Ten Commandments in the New Testament that next section 
50 days, it was 50 days from the resurrection of Jesus to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And let's turn to Acts uh, chapter 1 and look at those verses there. Uh, we're going to do verses 1 through 4. All right. Acts chapter 1. Let's read that all together. The former treaties have I made, O Theopolis, are all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them, what? Forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. All right, that's enough on, on those scriptures. But you see that Moses was on the mountain during the fifty uh, after the fifty days, getting the Ten Commandments from God. And here Jesus gave commandments to the disciples before he left. You see, you, so many things that are parallel. So we see in the Old Testament the 50 days. We see in the New Testament the 50 days because there before, because uh, 10 days before he was seen and then, then the 40 days he spent with them. All right. So the next slide. So the Old Testament, they were told to tarry for until they were, they were told to tarry. And so Exodus 24, 14 says, and he said unto the elders, tarry ye here for us until we come again unto you. And behold, Aaron and her are with you. If any man have any matters to do, let him come unto them. So that was Moses speaking to the children of Israel. And then Luke 24, 49 in the New Testament. If I can see that slide again too. Let's read that together. And behold, I send the promise of my father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. So the Old Testament, they were told to tarry. The New Testament, they were told to tarry. And then, then they also had a 40-day wait. Exodus 24, 14, and he said unto the uh, uh, elders, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, 24, 18. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. And then when we look at the New Testament, Jesus, I know I'm working you back there, a little back and forth with the scriptures. I appreciate you guys doing an awesome job. All right, the next, that, that same that same slide you just had that had the 40 for the New Testament. And we see Moses getting the, getting the Ten Commandments on the mountain. The next one Next slide, please. The Feast of Pentecost again, contrasting the old with the new. They were all on one accord, and they built an altar in the Old Testament to an idol. In Exodus 32, 1, it says, And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we what not what is become of him. And so also in the New Testament, they were on one accord in prayer. And that was Acts 1.14. That slide, please, showing the New Testament. The New Testament slide. All right. There it is. So they were on one accord in prayer. Let me read Acts 1.14. And just hold that slide up there, please. 
These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Okay, I need to go back to the other slide, please. <laughs> that last point, that second point on that slide about the fire. There we go. All right. Old Testament, Exodus 19, 18, uh, and Mount Sinai was altogether on smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. And you see in the New Testament, uh, Acts 2, 3, uh, it says, And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So I wanted to just show you contrasting the, the two uh, the, the Old Testament and New Testament to show the similarities. Um, then the next slide, please. We see Moses. That's where Moses is. Uh, he came down from the mountain. They had built the golden calf. And he had the pillars in his hand, the tablets that had the the uh, uh, the Ten Commandments in there. And he got upset with the people. And of course, he broke those first that first set. The first set of the Ten Commandments they were written by the finger of God. The second set, of course, he had to do it himself. So, so, so anyway, uh, the next one. Uh, I have a little cartoon there. My little cartoon. Can I show my little cartoon? Yeah, it says, so Aaron, you actually expect me to believe that you accidentally dropped a bunch of gold in the fire and it just happened to come up looking like this calf here. <laughs> All right, next slide, please. All right, and so you see that they were in one accord in, in, in the um, New Testament, they were in prayer. They were in the upper room, and they were in one accord. Whereas on, in the uh, Old Testament, they were on one accord, but they got into mischief. mischief. They, they were both fearful. They, the Old Testament, they were fearful because of the fact that Moses had left, and they didn't know when he was coming back. They were, they were fearful in the New Testament because they were fearful of their lives. They were afraid that they were going to get killed after Jesus had, had, had left because of the fact that he was crucified, and they figured they were next in line since they were followers of him, amen. But see, in the New Testament, what happened uh, is in, in uh, John, the 20th chapter, verses 21 and 22, the verses tell us that then Jesus said to them again, peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. So he breathed on them and caused them to have the ability to stay until the, the time of the promise. All right, next slide, please. So we also see the fact, the, the thundering and the, and the lightning that took place on the Mount uh, Sinai while, while the, the Lord was speaking to Moses. And see, what's so when you look at the difference is that Jesus was there with them in the Old Testament, but, I mean the New Testament, but in the Old Testament, they were distanced from God. They had a distance, they, you know, they were afraid and they were w willing to just speak through Moses in order to, to come to God. Well, the fact is that the mountain, the Lord told told them they had to draw boundaries because if they crossed that boundary, they would die because, you know, the, the scripture in the Old Testament say, you know, you, no one will see the Lord and live. So there was that distance there. But see, the, see how God, you know, in his sovereignty and in, in his love for us, how he bridged the gap that we can have that personal relationship with the Lord, that we don't have to go through the priests in order to pray but that we have access directly to God, that he, you know, and during that time, even during that time when God was speaking to them in the Old Testament, he told them that I'm going to make you a nation. I'm going to cause you to be a kingdom of priests. And he was bringing forth the Ten Commandments and the laws and judgments so that they can become that nation and have those guidelines that they needed in order to, to function as a nation. But God took them, you know, when you go into the New Testament, it goes into a new level because it was the birth of the church. Amen. So we see 
that when, when we look at the scriptures and, and what God has done, you see the, the faithfulness of God, amen. And, and let's look at that next slide because when you, when you compare what happened in their behavior, see, during the time of Pentecost, we see the fire. They had the, uh, the Old Testament. They saw the fire in a distance on the mountain. But in the New Testament, it was like cloven tongues of fire that set on their shoulders, amen, that was a, a, around them that they can experience. The next, the next uh, slide, please. So uh, one more comparison of the Old Testament and the New Testament. In, uh, in Exodus 32, 28, because of their disobedience, uh, 3,000 people were destroyed in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, during the day of Pentecost, we see in Acts 2.41 that over 3,000 people were saved. So you see how God begins to undo what was done? And when we think about the Feast of Pentecost, it's undoing what, what has been done. And, and, and this is a time to say, Lord, there's some things that I'm not proud of and I know that I shouldn't have done. I need these things undone. This is a season for things to be undone because it is, once again, it's a, it's a time of jubilee. It's a time of cancellation of debts. It's a, it's a time that God can erase those things that, were not, uh, that we know was not pleasing to him and we're not proud of in ourselves. We don't have to carry all this junk around with us. We have a choice. Jesus carried it on the cross for us. And just as we continue to study and learn about the feasts of the Lord, then it reinforces God's love for us, the provision that he's made for us and the protection that he's provided for us and the promises that he gave to us because he said that you're going to receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Amen. So the next slide in, in, in um, uh, summary, um, this, is, this is when they're in one accord and the spirit uh, of the Lord came upon them in the, in, in the outpouring. Go to the next slide, please. All right. I want to just, you know, just once again, just compare the two, uh, the Old Testament, New Testament, and then just do a summary of the spring feast. And I'm going to have uh, uh, um, Deacon Neil come forth and share, and then we'll have the young people. So we see that Passover is the type, uh, and, and then the, how the crucifixion is the, is the, is the, is the uh, anti-type of the Passover. On the Feast of Unleavened Bread, it, it refers to Christ being in the grave. The, the Feast of First Fruits was talking about Christ as what? Resurrection. And then, of course, what we're just talking about, the Feast of Weeks, is talking about the harvest, Pentecost, harvest of souls. Old Testament, the souls were destroyed because of the idol worship. But in this New Testament, there's the harvest of souls that we can expect because he's, we, God, you know, it's like Jesus came, he, he flipped the script, amen, because the word, you know, the word of God said, the wages of sin is death but then it goes on and says but the gift of God is eternal life that last slide please and we see the we see all the all uh, four of the feasts you see the the first feast the feast of Passover Jesus death once again the uh, first fruit Sunday will receive the the first fruits and then of course the second feast is the feast of unleavened bread and that's for how many days Seven days, excellent. And then, of course, and, and that was his that that represent his burial. So we have the we have Jesus' death, his burial, his resurrection, and then you, there's a forty day, fifty days. You see in the timeline that goes into the feast of Pentecost and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, uh, Deacon Neil. Just a reminder, this is the year of the plow, and I, and I pray that during this time that there has been some things that have plowed up uh, that might have been holding you captive so that you can experience God's freedom, amen, and utilizing the weapons of warfare, amen. amen. Hallelujah. So I'm not going to go through all the preliminaries, and he already started, so... Um, Coming from my generation, when I, when we first started doing the feast, um, it's been about seven years now. Three first three four years, I'm I was like, what, <laughs> what is this? <laughs> this, <laughs> what is this horseradish? What is this this stuff that we eat in? Like, it was it was really hard for me to grasp the concept, um, but. As you just like she said, the more you do it, and and that's what he established. He said it was seven, 
seven days. So seven days is a week. So basically, you're going to be doing this until you out of here. So that was one thing that stood out to me, that he, the seven days that, okay, you're going to seven days, and then it starts over seven days again. So we're supposed to continue to do it. So the more you do it, the the more revelation. Um, we talked about the different the different feast, the Passover. I mean, I never it never really clicked until like the, maybe the last two times we did it about the Passover. That when it was when it was in the Old Testament, it was for them being they're getting ready to go out of bondage, being getting ready to get delivered. And I mean, for our generation, that still applies to us today because. I'm one of those people in the generation, you know, you want, you got questions, you're looking for information, and like Dr. Sandra said, it's a lot of misinformation out there. So you can go in the quest of information, you can come across that misinformation which can come as off as a stumbling block. And it did trip me up in some stuff because um, I was talking with my wife, you know, back in the days, they took the word for what it was. We have questions, cause if it it doesn't sound right, okay, okay, yeah, some some wrong with the Bible, but I like the way that God did it. He made it foolproof. Like even if they did try to go in and manipulate it, is and people say, oh, it was written by man. No, when you when you go from beginning, cause he told he told the end in the beginning in Genesis. He said, I'm going to send a champion. He said, I'm going to cause enmity. So we already knew that we were going to go. It's going to be two kinds of people. But in that, in the, in the Passover, he said that it should be for his people. But it was also he called them strangers. So it meant for the Gentiles and for the Jews. He, he set this thing in motion way back. And I was like, oh, he, he did that. So. When I was doing my research, some of the people, they take the feast in a religious manner. So they just do it out of a practice. But the way we are different is because we have the revelation of Christ. They, they definitely point to each other. I was like, okay, that's the connection. Um, like Dr. Dr. Sandra already showed on some of the slides, the parallels. Um, one of the parallels that I was looking at in particular was the, um, the, the number 40 and then in the 40. When Christ came back, he came back and he taught for 40 days on the kingdom of God. So in the Old Testament, basically when God was giving them instructions, the kingdom of God is basically his government. So he was giving them instructions on how to govern themselves. I was like, oh. And then the 10 days in between the 40 and the 50, the number 10 represents God's government. So it's like he encoded all this information and he took it from a farmer's standpoint because they was an agricultural people. Wow. He had the scripture. It says that um, about the concept of seasons being laid out in Genesis. It said, as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat. She just talked about the desert where it's hot in the day and it's cold at night. So. I got so excited because he he has all this information, but it's coded. But you have to receive the revelation. And that's what we've been praying for, the revelation of who Christ is and who we are in Christ. Which Christ is the plan that God had for redemption. So I was like, okay, so if he's redeeming us, that means we were already there. So for my generation, speaking for my generation, it, it spoke a lot. Okay, we were already at this place. He's just trying to get us back to where we already were. I was just, I, I mean, I was amazed by that. And just the parallels about sowing and reaping. If you look into all areas of life, that's basically what it's about. We got, we sow, we go through the dry season, we go through the rainy season, we go through stuff messing with our crop. We go through caterpillar, canker, canker worms. But guess what? He already promised us that he would fulfill it. He said he would restore all of that stuff that was taken from him. I was like, man, all this through the feast. So the feast is, is not just on the face, on face value. It just seems like, okay, you're going through this routine. Okay, well, you know, 
Okay, and then the unleavened bread, that, that spoke a lot to me too because with unleavened, um, Dr. Sandra mentioned it in her last message that the leaven, if you equate it to the world or our diet is, feast, um, is yeast. Yeast is a fungus. If you do your research in the scripture, that was actually one of the curses. Okay, so what, is this, what does the yeast represent? Okay, sin was a curse. But Christ, when she was talking about the unleavened bread, I was like, okay, so he was unleavened bread. We were able to partake of the unleavened bread in our diet. Now, if you get too much yeast in your body when you eat, you get yeast infections, you get toenail fungus, nail fungus. So even the Lord, he speaks in the natural, but he also speaks in the spirit. I was like, it just it, it's so much confirmation it's no way to me for those people that have questions about the scripture. If if you get involved with the feast, which is basically causing you to come out of your timing and get into God's timing. That's the main thing that we have to do. OK, this is not just for us to be doing something. It's a purpose behind everything. It's no waste in God's economy. So we doing it. And, it, you know, I was like, OK, like I said, in the first three, four years, I was like, what, what is what is doing? Okay, we got to go eat this nasty stuff. <laughs> but as I started to get more revelation, that it was able to speak more than just us eating this the horseradish. Which I did not like horseradish. But <laughs> one thing about the horseradish, sometimes my sinuses are blocked up. It cleared up. So to me, that even spoke to me that you get deliverance from this. It's not you just going through... Like, I've, I had a physical manifestation of deliverance from eating the, the horseradish, which was bitter. But that's Christ. When, when we take on what he went through, and we end up becoming that bread. So we're going to be broken like bread and poured out like wine. And when it comes to when he had that last meal with them, he was still doing what they were used to do. He came on their level. He said, okay, this is what I know what y'all used to. But he was doing something, setting us up for the future, which is for the kingdom to come back, which now we have the kingdom government that we operate in already here in this earth realm. I just I just like the feast because, I mean, all of them, even this next one about the, the Pentecost that he reminds you to count. OK, basically how what I got out of that, he wants you to be reminded of what he's doing. You okay? You're at the okay. This is the 16th days of the Shavuot. You gotta, and then when it's the 17th, then you go and reflecting back on all the. So we have to be in remembrance. Christ said, "As often as we do it, doing in remembrance to Him." This is the last thing I wanted to do. Um, say, basically, the feast they all point to Christ, right? But if you look at Christ and listen to what He said, everything He said it pointed back to God. Everything that he said. So God, I was like, you got a real sense of humor. He pointed everything to Christ. And then when Christ came, Christ pointed everything back to him. So it's really, it's all about him when it gets down to it. That's, that's, that's where that saying comes from. It's all about him. It's not about us. It's about him. Even Christ said, the guy was like, why do you call me good? Christ, this, this Christ said. He said, nobody's good but the Father. This, this Christ, he said it. So that's what I want to share for my generation. It's, not, it's, it's more than just a feast. It's more than just religious activities that we're going through and that the grace of God, it represents the grace of God that he was gracious even though we fail. He was gracious to make all these provisions. Even at the moment that we fail, he already had the plan in place. All we have to do is just walk it out. It's, it's a fixed battle. He already told us that we win. So, yeah, we're going to go through battles. You're going to suffer some wounds every now and then. But he already told you the end in the beginning. So I just that's, that's what I wanted to share for my generation.
good afternoon. <laughs> um, I, I, it was impressed upon me to talk with Dr. Sandra because I wanted to start um, talking with the youth in regards to the spring feast um, so that they are learning as they are growing. And so they are like, oh, they're saying all of our stuff. But <laughs> I have I allowed them to jot down some notes from some of the things that they said so that they wouldn't feel too, like, nervous or anything. So I'm going to give this to them. <coughs> and um, we actually used the same uh, poster that Dr. Sandra used. <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to start. There are four spring feasts. Um, I'm here to talk about the Feast of Passover, which represents the crucifixion of Jesus. And also the night of the Passover, they roasted a male lamb and they put blood over the ark of the door so the death angel would pass over. Um, I'm talking about the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It lasted for seven days and it's bread without yeast. Leaven is considered a sin and it's associated with the burial of Jesus. Feast of First Fruits. Feast of First Fruits is associated with the resurrection of Jesus. That's when Jesus ascended to heaven to sit on God's right hand. And the Feast of First Fruit also consists of when you bring your offering to the high priest and he weighs it in the air for blessing. <laughs> Feast of Pentecost. Pentecost means 50, and 50 days after the First Fruit Sunday, Holy Spirit descended from heaven. Thank you. Amen. We're closing the gap here at Acts Ministries in the generations. And that's one thing we're learning. You know, they talk about the different generation, like the millennials, is the fact that one of the things is that they want to be included and they need to be included in the services. It's nice that they have separate services, but I know when, when my kids were coming up in church, uh, 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 children's church was in the uh, sanctuary. They learned how to sit still and be quiet, and they, and they didn't have any trouble at school because they learned that discipline. So, you know, we, we, we thank God for for uh, the, sh the sharing that is taking place as far as with uh, uh, the generation that uh, uh, Deacon Neal was uh, representing and also our young people. It's just an it's exciting time. So speaking of our young people, we are going to uh, uh, shift a little bit today and we're going to prepare because we do have a dedication. We have another generation, amen, that we're going to dedicate. So we're going to get prepared for that, at, uh, Dr. Gay. <coughs> you're getting ready for the dedication oh okay what do we have now very last all right well then we're going to go do our announcements and take our offering at, and uh, receive our offering and then we're going to do the very last thing before we close out we're going to do our dedication so our announcements uh, we just want to uh, we had an awesome time uh, yesterday we had a powerful service and we want to thank all of you that came and, and, and uh, were uh, participated. Uh, just a powerful word. And we'll be getting that duplicated for you this week. And if you didn't, uh, uh, weren't able to make it, you want to get the CD. The CD, of course, is free. We just ask that you listen to it and pass it on. And, of course, if you were here, you, you, I'm sure you couldn't take notes because the, the man of God really brought forth a powerful message. So you want to get the CDs uh, on Wednesday when they get uh, uh, printed out. So we're going to um, just want to remind you, of course, we do have a breakout session coming up the next month, which will be tomorrow. The month of May starts tomorrow, and that will be the fifth Wednesday. We'll have our breakout session, and just remind, remember that we start our service at 630 for dinner, and then we have our regular, uh, then we have the regular um, uh, breaking out in the groups for the couples, the singles, and for the youth. So invite others to come out. It's a time of outreach and a time of fellowship. Amen. And then, of course, uh, keep in prayer and keep in mind we are planning to have an inner healing conference in the month of August, and so we're getting geared up for that, and we'll get more information regarding that coming up, and also we'll be uh, looking for ministers to to uh, retrain or to kind of refresh uh, to uh, help in that conference, so we're looking to have an exciting time uh, for that. Is there any other announcements, uh, Dr. Gay?
Good. Good. Good, good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> hey, um, oh, we're so excited um, about the spring feast, and you know, uh, after the seas had, after we had broken up the final ground and sown seeds of righteousness to ourselves, and the Lord said He would send down uh, the, the the righteous rain. Um, I just sense uh, in my spirit that uh, we're getting ready to start some more training. Uh, we're going to we're going to start some more prophetic training, uh, helping people to understand the gifts uh, that uh, the Spirit of the Lord has divided unto you. Uh, these are things that we did year uh, years ago, and uh, there was a, there was a time that uh, almost everybody in the house was flowing prophetically. Uh, the young people, all the way up to the uh, uh, the uh, uh, elder, this folks. So we're going to start those training again. I believe that's the new growth that's taking place. And we want to plug in all generations, amen, so that it will not be a gap. And to understand that the, uh, that the gifts of the Holy Spirit uh, is not prejudice. Uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit is to every believer, amen? amen? Praise the Lord. The Lord was using me in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and I wasn't even speaking in tongues. How you figure that out? Glory be to God. So, but I love it that God, he, he, um, he goes beyond traditional uh, religious um, uh, beliefs. And uh, so uh, I'm excited about it, and I'm excited about uh, the teaching that we, have, uh, that we have received. We pray and trust that you will get those CDs, listen to those CDs, and you may have to listen to it over and over and over. I remember when my mentor, who's gone on to be with the Lord, he had given me a book, and it was helping me to understand the shifting to the apostolic and the prophetic uh, 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 grace or the kingdom teaching. And I read that book many, 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 many times until it start clicking, until it start, I start getting the revelation. I had to do my part, and the Lord began to start manifesting himself. So I'm excited. Get those CDs, listen to them over and over and over, and then you will understand uh, the encoding, as Deacon Neal was talking about. Uh, uh, you will understand uh, 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 the timing of the Lord, the appointed times of God and uh, his holy feasts or his convocations. Uh, and when you hear certain words or certain conversations and when they begin to say they're gonna do this and do that, and because you understand the timeline with God, you understand that they're doing things out of season. Yeah. It sounds good, it's religious. God don't hold it against them, amen, because when they don't know, they just don't know. Yeah. But isn't this something that when you come into alignment, how many have ever experienced Maybe your back giving you trouble, your neck giving you trouble. You had to go to the chiropractor. Oh, yeah. Amen. And once the chiropractor got through, they just, they just put you back into alignment. Oh, yeah. Amen. Oh, yeah. Amen. But when you're out of alignment, man, it hurts. And you, some oh, yeah. people just learn to live with it. <laughs> hey, praise the Lord. How you doing? <laughs> yeah. 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 It's just me and Jesus. <laughs> Amen. And they mean well. They mean well. But until they come into and alignment. Somebody said alignment. And that's what these teachings are doing. These teachings are bringing us into alignment. I'm going to say this. I'm really, really going to go. For years, and I had the same concept. I had the same heart, the same passion. I wanted to see our Jewish people saved. Those who uh, was practicing, uh, you know, their Jewish beliefs, you know, uh, the Messianic Jews. Okay, I thought they was missing it, man. You know, we need to get them saved. But, but now you found out that they was doing, they was doing what they supposed to do. And, and you're finding now a lot of ev evangelical, uh, evangelical places of worship, of churches, of ministries, they're embracing. They embrace, they're coming what? They're coming into alignment and find out that they had it all the time. Glory be to God. Isn't that something they had it all the time? So we see the we the Gentile, the wild olive branch, is really getting connected now. It's, it's scriptures in your Bible. For I'm not my time. But I'm telling you, but the wild olive branch now is getting connected to the main olive branch. And the same DNA. Hmm? The same DNA. And once that DNA begin to run in that wild olive branch, you won't be able to tell the difference. And regardless of the ethnicity or what you want to call it, an ethnic group, you can, just can't tell the difference. Just know that you just love the Lord. Whether you Jewish or you Gentile, they love the Lord, and everybody's in alignment. Isn't that powerful?